there are several other other decisions made by the Supreme Court that I want to uh, I, I want to talk about. Before I go into that, let's talk about, however, that the Senate passed a bill. Let me pull it up. The Senate passed a bill um, that okayed, I forgot how many million in order to go to resources to provide more security for Supreme Court justices. I think it's 19 million. I think yes. it's 19 million. 19 million. Uh, Supreme Court, Supreme Court justices. Is it now more their family? Because I know I, from what I heard, from what I could understand, that this had been on the table. Um, this is something that it just didn't pop up, with, you know. But it had been on the table. But congressional members were holding out because they said that they wanted more security resources for their fa family members too, as well. So, can you explain how? What does the bill look like? Um, in terms of so it. let's just talk about the instead of just getting into the notes and cranning of the bill let's talk about the the reason that we've been on this trajectory okay we've been on this trajectory since january since the january 6th uh uh the hearing started with january 6th so once um uh, once benny thompson out of mississippi right uh, who's the chairman of the homeland secure uh, of homeland security uh, inside of the house once he pushed to have these hearings, then a larger conversation got started about them, then the security of all of these government officials. And it, got, it started to become more and more narrow and zoomed in on justices once people became aware that Clarence uh, Thomas's wife had been involved. So that is actually where this kind of starts is that once we find out that Clarence Thomas's wife um, was involved in January 6th, now there is then this, this outcry about what are we going to do to protect them? And not only protect them, but then protect their families, right? So that is where this kind of started. Now it's metastasized in many ways because Folks inside the legislature, especially on the Democratic side, said, well, now we're talking about producing or, or providing resources to protect them. But you guys didn't say anything about protecting us when our families were getting death threats all around the, you know, stop the steal, right? When we came and brought these concerns about true security, we've been saying you know, while Trump was in office, that we that we as legislators needed the security and our families needed the security. And you guys played it off as partisan politics. Now that the tide has shifted, now you want to say that then these justices and their families need um, security and protection. And they're not nearly as visible as legislators, right? Mm -hmm, legislators mm -hmm. are far more visible than the Supreme Court is. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the battle has been back and forth. And from what I understand how the bill has, has worked its way um, as kind of, uh, as, as kind of self the agreement goes back in many ways to that nuclear family. If mm -hmm. you are in any way attached to that Supreme Court justice, in a, in a, it, from a nuclear family pers perspective, then you have the right to then um, get some level of protection. And I, and I believe that's where they've kind of settled. But I want to make it clear that this conversation hinges in many ways on um, what was happening before January 6th and then what became the fervor once uh, we had um, the breach of the Capitol. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's a, there's, there's some, shady bad optics about this i'll just point to one <laughs> you know because you know it's the, for me i'm like this is very interesting that you have um you know the spouse who clearly participated in some traitorous um activities uh be protected when uh after um the uvalde massacre um, information resurfaced about how constitutionally police do not have to protect the public in general against being harmed, right? So these are some really bad, funky optics because it plays into this idea that only power is protected rather than the people, right? So I just wanted to, you know, put that, you know, put that out uh, in, in terms of what that looks like. And as well, this, this critique about how those who make laws or make important decisions around 
regulations and policies and so on and so forth are afforded these resources when those who, who are at the, 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 the brunt of it and what the funky, what it looks like when it's real funky, funky or not. Um, so I just wanted to, 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 to talk about that, but there is an overall refunding of police uh, that is going on um, across the country. It's really big in New York. Um, it is happening um, somewhat, uh, well, well, not in Los Angeles. There's a, it's, it's a very complicated, but Los Angeles LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department has the largest police budget in the country. And the LA County Sheriff currently, Alex Villanueva, but we've been talking to um, LA County Sheriffs, even um, um, a, a brother by the name of Eric Strong, a black man who ran, um, talks about you know, how um, this like really sordid history of gangs um, in the police department. So this is gonna, that's gonna be, I know that's, that's a whole side note, but I wanted to just add that caveat when we're talking about security and protection. You have any thought, last thoughts on that or you wanna expand this discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to expand the discussion when we come to what policing was to begin with. And I know people get tired of me beating this drum. Policing started because they needed to deal with Negroes who had been freed, who were leaving plantations, but had nowhere to go. And so uh, that is where we get uh, the, the Vagrancy Act of of 1867 that has now morphed into modern day uh, loitering laws, right? And so what I what I guess I want the reason that I'm bringing this up is that there, it that the policing or protection has always then been centralized, but it has always been central centralized around who has power. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that is, is that if I own the land and have the power to call you a criminal because you're on this land and call you a loiterer or to establish laws to thou make your, uh, your inability to leave a crime, then I am the one that has the power to then uh, influence the discourse. And so what I'm saying, I, I guess my point is that policing and protection in this country has always been around who has power who can define what is powerful. And, there, so, and so in many ways, this is no different than the legacy of what we understand prote protection and policing to look like. And the last thing I'll say is that is why we often see um, the, then the policing of commercial areas because what we see to be powerful in our society is capital. Mm -hmm. And so business in many ways represent capital and then the protection of said capital. And that to me is why this is just a shift, not a diversion from what we have historically seen in this country when it comes to protection and power. This is so connected to conversations around Juneteenth that I had within the last week um, in that, you know, a lot of people, well, people were twerking, twerking for Juneteenth. Uh, <laughs> you know, those of us who uh, are from, I would say roughly Louisiana and West who celebrated or knew about Juneteenth our whole lives understand it's a day that is mixed with celebration, but also this morning, right? of what the United States did in order to hold more capital by not um, allowing Texas, which was a huge slaveholding state, uh, those enslaved people know, you know that, that, that they were emancipated. So this ties into policing because also part of incarceration was how now do we deal with this forced free labor that has been dismantled? Like how do we rebuild from the civil war? that we had, right? How Which is we why the 13th Amendment says, slavery is illegal unless you committed a crime. Okay. That's right. right, that's right. And, and then- and, mm -hmm. and, and so now I need to criminalize your normal behavior so I can re-enslave you then to rebuild the area that we've torn down to keep you as a slave. And the, excellent point. And then also, how do we deal well, you know, these quasi citizens who become citizens eventually uh, with them accessing the same laws that we afforded these European immigrants, the Homestead Act and all these and using these these uh, uh, laws of enfranchisement and being highly successful with them, like like outperforming 
uh, you know, people who are coming with 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 low education or menial education, uh, and you have these craftsmen, these artisans, these bankers, these master chefs, these growers, you know. So so we we also must like fold that in in terms of understanding like how policing never really was about safe communities, right? That is just a, a, a rhetoric and a plug line. Now, albeit there are definitely police officers who do believe that, but we all know they get into these departments and they know that that's not what it was about. So I want to move into, we're talking about police, let's talk about guns. Another decision <laughs> that the uh, uh, SCOTUS, <laughs> This is like pissed off to pissivity conversation, right? Oh, oh gosh, do I, do I talk about the guns or do I talk about the Miranda rights first? Oh my goodness. The guns are more important. Okay, all the right. Guns are, and, and, and let me tell you why the guns are more important. Mm -hmm. The guns are more important because the Miranda rights or the understanding of Miranda has been eroding since, since, the, since the day the Miranda, uh, <laughs> the Miranda rights then became law. They have been literally... Uh, uh, been they have literally been being uh, dismantled since then. The guns are more important, and the guns are more important because then the non-regulation of guns then mm -hmm. almost makes the Miranda piece almost null and void. If that I right. mean, not right. that it's not important, but it's not. But but the Miranda piece is once you've already been apprehended, once right. you've already been caught, but we already know with the with 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 the wild wild west that we're now producing, Ooh. people may not be caught because they'll be dead. Right, right. So 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 just to give people just a very quick foreground, uh this week or this past week, US Supreme Court ruled in a six three vote. Uh, that New York's restrictive licensing uh, regime for firearm carry permits is unconstitutional. As a result, it expands the Second Amendment uh, to where people could carry guns outside of the home for the first time. Uh, and so when things are taken, these, you know what I'm saying, we got to bring it to the one-on-one, one on one. When things are taken to the high court. Uh, this was this was a um, something that uh, um, comes out of New York, but it, uh, it's applicable all over the United States. So just like the Mississippi um, um, case, you know, is the one that overturns Roe v. Wade nationally. So I just wanted to, you know, break that down. So yeah, so, so let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's start at this piece about why out of the home is important, because there's something called the Castle Doctrine. And I mm -hmm. want to be clear about this and get people to understand this. It's very simple. It's nothing that's that deep for us to understand. It is the idea that you get to protect your castle with then a firearm, right? Mm -hmm. And that castle doctrine said that the person had to be on your property, in your home, depending on how that castle was looked at in your state after in many ways and i don't want to say just because of what happened in buffalo but in many ways the re the response to what happened in buffalo said that then they were going that the state of new york was going to expand uh rules around concealed carries meaning that you would have to have a mm -hmm. special reason to be able to have mm -hmm. a, a, a a firearm that was concealed and what the supreme court said was is that that is unconstitutional because then it then limits then um, the the intention of or it limits what is then enlisted inside of the Second Amendment. And the reason that is controversial, I think, in, in many ways, not just because of Buffalo and New York and the precedent it sets across the country, it is because it expands this castle doctrine. It mm -hmm. is it expands the castle doctrine in then saying that. Now what can be defended is your personhood at all times mm -hmm. and not just your castle. And that is problematic because it's all going to be subjective on narrative. Because as a Black person in this country, if I'm saying I'm protecting myself um, and, have, and, have, and have, let's say, shot a white person of another race, then what does that then mean and uh, in, 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 in the inverse? And in my true opinion, I believe that this is uh, the legend. I wouldn't say the legislation, but this is then the overturning uh, or then the or then the match 
that then gives a green light to race wars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this gives a mm -hmm. green light to race wars mm -hmm. because now it is outside of then your castle and outside of then this property uh, and, and then allows them for personhood to be centralized. And that is what I want people to get out of this, that the reason that this is important is this is bigger than just the state of New York. The idea of the expansion is about personhood throughout the entire United States. Now here to me is where the rub comes in. Mm. We're talking about the expansion of personhood throughout the entire United States, yet we are still requiring guns then to be permitted by state. Mm. <laughs> we are still requiring guns to then be permitted by the state. So then my question then becomes, if we're gonna expand, expand the castle doctrine and expand then the use of the second amendment, then why are we not having a, a national gun registry then? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Why is then mm -hmm. not a mm -hmm. national gun mm -hmm. registry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now the next step? Well, mm -hmm. why not? Because you don't wanna trample on state rights. Mm. The, 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 the tangle web that is woven, right? Um, um, and we haven't even we haven't even factored in that gun violence post pandemic it, crime has actually reduced in the United States. People ain't got no money, you know what I'm saying? But uh, gun violence uh, and has and increased has increased like spiked crazily, and it is in these urban areas that you're seeing these spikes and 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 also um, theft. Um, as well, but this is a result of the 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 economy uh, with theft. So now we have in this post pandemic, you have a a surge of gun violence, and now people a license is not required for you to carry a gun when you you go out you go outside, right? So and in this highly volatile uh, and tense times, where there's a lot of like you said racial issues and social issues still, and you have a lot of crazies. I mean, they just talked about how there was this, um, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, abortion protest in, uh, was it Iowa? And Iowa. The, and, and, and the uh, some person in a truck ran through ran the through. protest. Mm -hmm. protest. Mm -hmm. So if you have that, you know, it is creating, it is creating chaos. It is creating like a national Gotham. Like, uh, uh, you know, construct, I call this constructed chaos. I've been, you know, saying that. So we got to move forward because this, this stuff is dizzying. The things that we all have to wrap our heads around in terms of how we have to prepare to move outside. And even though you're a professor, I'm a professor, we still engage with the public. And I often think about what is that going to look like? You know, um, you know, I'm at a PWI, right? And moving through, um, you know, you know, the cities I go through, I am thinking very much about that. But let's go to another. So we talked about the Miranda rights. So let me give the people. Okay, another thing um, is is that police officers. This is another thing cannot be subject to civil liability for failing to warn criminal suspects of their Miranda rights. So if the uh, cops do not read Miranda rights uh, to uh, people they detain or arrest, then they will not be held liable. So that cannot be used. Because that used to be like a, 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 a something that was used a lot. Well, I wasn't informed of my rights in, in terms of throwing out cases. So, the, so let me, yeah, so let's let, let explain what that even means because many may not know this. Miranda rights are the understanding from uh, the, the, uh, the first 10 amendments to our constitution called the Bill of Rights, the understanding of not, not having to self-incriminate. And so because you do not have to self-incriminate, you may have heard the idea of I plead the fifth, right? So the Miranda rights are connected to your fourth amendment right and your fifth amendment right. And what is now being said is that the police officers who do not then extend um, those rights to you are not then liable for not doing so. Meaning that there is no legal penalty, whether civil or a uh, criminal for them not then extending constitutional rights. And let me tell you why I believe that this is dangerous. Because then, for me in many ways, the reason this liability calls into question uh, 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 
our whole structure to begin with is because it then allows us to pick and choose portions of the Constitution. And mm -hmm. so what we are essentially doing is we are devalidating the Constitution because we are then allowed the, the, the document that is supposed to then uh, uh, adjudicate uh, how we are then uh, allowed to then be freed and then be constricted in this country mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. now being contorted then to then uh, be the sounding board for particular issues. And so it is ironic to me that on one hand, we are expanding the second amend amendment and then we are reducing the sting of the fourth and the fifth amendment. You know, to me, I see this as um, kind of like a connect, connect the dots to disempowering the citizen like like and it's all dealing with in my opinion different forms of how ma how mass incarceration um is it, or incarceration is going to kick up because in the pandemic that was something we said uh, a lot of people were released in the pandemic uh, because of covid and how jails what how jails going to make money right but 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 this is all part of to me these um, ways in which to incarcerate, maintain incarceration for, for folk. I mean, I mean for, for those who are vulnerable and don't have the legislative power, the council, the money or the resources to circumnavigate that, right? Especially if you're in a community where the officers don't come from your community, right? And you don't have any type of conversation with them. Like you, you know what I mean? So, uh, okay. So I'm, and this I'm the last thing on that, mm -hmm. and this is something that I want people to think about from an international perspective, because you know I'm an international scholar. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is the way that you artificially also keep your unemployment number numbers low, mm. right? Because the way that I keep my my because the way that I keep my unemployment uh, numbers low is then by saying a segment of my population is incarcerated and uneligible then to then be uh, to then uh, be employed. Well, then that allows you to have uh, an unemployment rate of six, seven, eight percent when the rest of the world, for the most part, are looking at uh, unemployment rates of 20 and 25 percent. Well, let's connect these dots. We know that when you are incarcerated, you can't vote, but you're still considered part of the voting population. So if you are incarcerated in a red territory, right, and, and they're voting all against your interests, you have no say, but you get that, you know, you, you make up that voting body, right? So a lot of people and don't that has a history. That has a history all the way back to slavery so, and mm -hmm. being able to count slaves uh, per the repre uh, the representational map that we first right. created. That has right. a legacy all the way back to that. Right. So all of these different things, while voter suppression is still an uptick, that was another thing I wanted to mention that we, we you know, what November 2022 looks like, we still have to, to think, you know, we'll see. However, there's still a lot of voter suppression that's going on. There's cases uh, throughout the country. So that also plays a part into the, the voting and what it looks like. And so um, this is just, okay. So the last thing I want to pull up is, is that um, this is connected to again, um, 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 uh, arrest or the criminal justice system in a 6-3 decision written by your boy, boy, Justice Clarence Thomas, <laughs> Supreme Court ruled that a federal court may not consider new evidence outside of the state court record in deciding whether the state violated a person's Sixth Amendment right. So we have four, five, and six, okay, uh, to effective assistance of counsel at trial, right? So this goes, this is uh, coming out of a case that happened in Arizona, uh, Shin versus Ramirez, where two men were sentenced to death in Arizona after they received constitutionally ineffective assistance at trial. So there was evidence brought up that basically their lawyer was shitty. Uh, and so they were um, sentenced to death and they were attempting to bring up this new information um, into the case. But a Supreme Court ruling has said from now on, that cannot be um, um, uh, a part of new, or new evidence like that cannot be brought up uh, in, in cases. This is, 
This is the federal level. So at, a, um, at, the clear, federal, at the federal that, level. That it can still happen at the state level, right? Yes. And, yes. and the reason that I want to be clear on that piece is this, because it now then it is now it behooves governors to if if the federal apparatus is wanting to then fall back on states' rights, then governors have to then assert their power and then stand inside of these governorships and then use that then power. And that is why I want to highlight that piece is that that cannot happen in the at the federal level. Mm -hmm. That 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 can't go to the that that cannot be included in federal court. Why does that matter? Because there's a matriculation of cases. Cases usually start if they are if they are if federal right. charges yeah. have been yeah. brought a case normally initiates inside of the state matriculates inside of that state process getting to the state supreme court coming out of that state supreme court and then uh getting getting inside of then the federal court which usually is to the federal appellate court so what this is saying is is that then if it goes to the federal appellate court then new evidence can't then be brought inside of that process but this is what i'm saying is that this can stop at the state supreme court based upon then what the governor then allows. Because mm -hmm. then when the case is heard at the state Supreme Court level, mm -hmm. then this evidence can be brought to bear. And this all has to, everything to do with then state legislature, I mean, uh, uh, state apparatuses. And this is why we have to be very keen and understanding that uh, that when we're going to go vote, that we get to vote on the governor. We get to vote on state assemblymen and senators. We get to vote on lo a lot of the people that are going to make direct decisions about how these cases matriculate at the state level. This might be a, a question that 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 can't can't be answered. So, a lot of cases that are um, thrown out, right, or overturned. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, death sentences or where there's just a lot of time. Are these cases heard at the state level or the federal level by the time it happens? Right. So it's, it depends. And I would mm -hmm. tell everyone to look at the Equal Justice Project because they have or the, EGI. the mm -hmm. EGI has great numbers mm -hmm. on this, uh, does a great job of really recording and looking at this. But but most of these things are happening, Kaia, actually at the state level. And okay. here's why. Okay. Because most people do not have the funds and the resources to get it inside of the federal courts, right? Okay. Which is why oftentimes EGI it, which is a resource to be able to get it up the chain. Because you, mm -hmm. people have to remember that a case can um, get into the appellate courts, but a case can only be heard at the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court has granted it sitori, meaning mm -hmm. that they are going to hear the case, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to hear the case because they believe it's going to change legal precedent, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why the Mississippi case with Roe v. Wade was heard at the Supreme Court level. Mm -hmm. So most of these cases, honestly, Gaia, can be dealt with at the state level because most of them, when it comes to being put to death, that's a state decision. Why is it a state decision? Because the 10th Amendment of the Constitution says anything that is not directly listed in this Constitution then becomes the right of the state. And the state has the right to police because it is not explicitly listed inside of the Constitution. So the state's right to police means the state has the right to bring up charges on you, etc. unless, like I said, you have federal charges. So a lot of these sentencing, I mean, a lot of these being placed to death cases are at and dealt with at the state level. Okay, that is a, we, I've learned a lot. Uh, you know, you are, you are definitely the civics uh, policy legislature guru. Um, um, I, I, it's a lot for me to, I have to sit back and think about uh, what, what a lot of this mean, means uh, to me and, and, and communities of color. Um, in the pre-show, and I say it again, we 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 both it, it was it was a sad joke, but we said that you know this is going to be in, an intense summer, uh, is going to be an intense fall, and um, I'm just really kind of thinking about how you know this is I would say what is this if we add in Trump years, this is going to be like the sixth year or maybe seventh if we add pre-elections that the United States has been uh, immersed in a lot of political emotional uh, turmoil. Uh, and so I, I guess as, as you know, I'm kind of thinking through, I'm also kind of thinking through of ways that we could still resist 
um, but also be very mindful of taking care of ourselves. It's so incredibly important. I mean, I mean even now um, in this, uh, you know, in the summer, because this is this is where our Republic goes very lo-fi, um, but it's like yet again, we're entering this fight. So I have a question that was long-winded. Black women have been the ones who have been the voting block, have been the ones to carry a lot of the democratic agenda. Now, I am of, you know, we, 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 you know me, I am highly critical. I say that the Republican Party, the Democratic Party are two sides of the same coin. I don't, you know, I, you know, the, the, the Republicans, um, you know, the Democrats are no angels, uh, you know, in, in all of this. But what does the Democratic Party or the party that says that they actually are moving towards Black women interests need to do in order to keep the Black women vote? So I, I think that what we're going to see uh, very, and this is like, again, another point about solidarity. I think what we're really going to start to see here again is this understanding that a lot of the petty beefs that have been happening inside of the Democratic Party of the idea of making this tent as large as possible and then packing it with people that then may fundamentally disagree with each other, then create more problems inside of the party versus being uh, far more... Um, um, mono, um, um, a mono or a one-minded when it comes to ideology on the Republican side, right? That's, I think, the biggest problem on the Democrat side is that they've created a tent so big that now they've included people that fundamentally disagree with one another inside of this tent, and it's, and it's bore itself out. Whereas Republicans have pretty much um, stayed on message since uh, the civil rights era and have been able to kind of consolidate that message. What I what I say what I say about this is that black women carrying the message or like I like to say the gospel of democracy is the unification tool necessary at this moment. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by the gospel of, de uh, of democracy? Again, it is the understanding that if none of us are free, if, 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 if all of us aren't free, then that means that none of us are free. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the message that's the unifying message that I that I'm seeing black women candidates continuously bring up as they frame issues. Your issue may be different from mine, but the, the repelling of each of these issues gets us further and further away from freedom. And so I think that is the unifying message. I think that's the unifying message. And unfortunately, this is where I'm always disheartened, right? It's the unifying message that's then on the backs of black women that have to then sell it, right? Uh, and and unfortunately, that is the case. Um, but I'm involved with a group called Win With Black Women. I posted something uh, that was supported by them after this decision. And what I've seen with those women, although a lot of them lean democratic, is that they have been very open to hearing both sides, right? They've been open to hearing what Republican um, black women have to say the same way they've been open to hearing what Democratic black women have to say. Uh, and so what what to, to me continues to be the unity point, especially on the Democratic side of this, is the idea of freedom and that the and that the protection of democracy gets us closer to freedom instead of away from it. Mm. Yeah, those are, that's a really good point. You just had me thinking Black Lives Matter from 2014 to roughly, let's say 2020, 21 has been on the backs of dead Black boys and young men or Black men for the most part, right? There's been women, but for the most part now it's on the backs of Black women and our wombs. This is some what? ill time. Well, I would say it's still been on the backs of Black women because if you take my only begotten son, mm -hmm. it is still on my Very emotional true. back. Very true. Right? So right, right. he's in the dead. And I'm not saying they haven't had to die. I, I, I want to be very right, clear about right. that. And, and I feel that black women don't get the same level of press, but black men have died at the hands and far more, right? right. But that leaves that leaves black mothers, black daughters, black nieces, black all of these black women that have to carry the burden of that, especially when it comes to a Tamir a Tamir Rice's mother who says, "Did I should why is we why was he in the park without me? Should he even have been there?" All of these things that then become the emotional toll of black women. And so what I would say in this is that it is still on the backs of black women now we've just become the primary target mm 
in right. a way that there we haven't go. been the primary target previously. Right. And so it was it's so fascinating how I'm sorry, I'm all loud now. It's so fascinating how um, you know, there was this thing of, you know, like once you take the black man out of the home, you know, everything will dismantle. No, no, black women are now you know the the the, the, tar the 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 target and this is this is what it what's what's happening right so i mean there's a lot of this is just one of a lot of just not only conversations but i, I really foresee us doing some really critical groundwork um because what i see in my community you know i'm from south central los angeles land of the scandalous um you know <laughs> You know, me living in, uh, you know, Newark and um, and now in Philadelphia is I see that there's a lot of work that I, as a scholar, as an academician, um, as somebody who has a media company, you know, must do. And I, this is why I feel like there's a redux, like, like you know, what is it? What is that? The race women said uh, um, something as we climb pulling as we climb. Oh, lift as we climb. L lifting as we climb. This is a lifting as we climb moment that's going on. We have very candid conversations. I know brilliant Black women all over the world, but just to keep it in the United States, I, I, can, I can off the dome name easily 40 brilliant Black women who do brilliant work and are severely underpaid, overworked, talents not being explored. So as we're trying to navigate this, we still are like, come on, you could do it. Let's go. And so this is where I see us, you know, doing doing a lot of work. Um, I, I, I embrace the the brothers uh, that are that 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 we that that we so we need them to love on us, and we we are their Ida B Wells to the Mister Wells. Y'all, Ida B's husband, because Ida B was going to retire. Right, Ida be the journalist for those you don't know who wrote about lynchings and inequities in the United States. And they burned her press down. Burned her press down. Actually, my birthday, we share the same birthday. Um, you know, she was going to retire because she had children. Her husband was like, uh, 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 boo boo, no, 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 they need you. So she put that, gave that baby to, the, to her, her boo thing and went. So we need brothers like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and, when you have and women, I'm so grateful for mine because he definitely <laughs> like okay. What you what what we doing? What you gonna do? Right? Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for mine. I say I know that's right. I mean, I the other day I was sitting, I was sitting on the floor, and we were supposed to be going somewhere, and here I am doing work. What I call like art for public to me is movement work. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing work. And my husband just said, you know, when I met you, this is exactly what you were doing 17 years ago. Like, and this is, this is who I am. It, it, it comes in different forms, but this is the movement work that I do. So as we wrap up, because I know you are about to go and do some great things and I don't want to stop your flow. Uh, what are your final thoughts on this really great and inspiring discussion? Yeah, I, I think these are, I think these are the, my, my closing sentiments. I want black women to be to give themselves the room to feel all the emotions of this mm -hmm. uh, uh, of this. Um, we as black women have had to watch many of our elders die in Buffalo. Mm. Watch children that share skin tones like us die in Uvalde. We have had to deal with a level of uh, of frustration around the loss of legislation. And I would even say the loss of many of our ancestors who could have guided us through this period. Mm. So I wanna, I, I really wanna say in this moment, give yourself the room to feel all of the emotions and do not allow anyone to tell you that your emotions are wrong. And then after that, after that space and time, has um, passed. Find a way to get in community. Find a way to get into community so that you can take your efforts um, and that those efforts are fortified. There are plenty of civic, Black civic organizations that are out here that are doing this work. Reach out to Dr. Uh, Dr. Shivers if you want to then help with Art Republic. 
Um, reach out to, to the Third Good Marshall Fund, who's doing great work as far as being able to put up scholarship or put up scholars in the HBCU community as well as the UNCF. Right. Uh, re, uh, reach out to the collective pack, a super pack that is very clear on what money they take and what money they don't take because they because they don't want the message to then be diluted. Getting community. Right. Getting community so that you don't feel like you're like you're spending your will and your efforts. And even if that means get connected to a black church. Right. Get connected to a black church if of none of those organizations suit you or fit you. But Find a place to get into community so that you do not feel in isolation. And remember, this is the key thing I would say, Black women, remember that Black men are just as confused, that mm -hmm. they are just as, um, some of them are just waking up to these realities and give them room to link arms with you and move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have to say anything else, but until the next time we chop it up, it has been an honor and a blessing to talk to you about these critical issues. If anybody I come to, I will be coming to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharice Janae Nelson. <laughs> like All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to Arc Republic. If you like what you see and you like what you hear, you can actually keep this mothership going. How? You can make a tax deductible donation in several ways. One, cash app us at Arc Republic Media. And you can also go on our website, arcrepublic.com forward slash donate. As well, you can also donate to our fiscal sponsor and our sister organization at Black Farmers Index, that is Cash App, or also go onto their website, blackfarmersindex.com. We are two Black women owned media organizations who share our profits so folk can thrive.